In episode 107, I used a quote from George Wald. I'm not sure when I first used that quote. It was quite a long time ago. It's so well known, I didn't think twice about using it. When it comes to the origin of life, we have only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation, arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation, that life arose from non-living matter, was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That leaves us with the only possible conclusion that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically, because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible, spontaneous generation arising to evolution. But in the comments, 7EBR told us that quote was a fraud, and George Walt never said any such thing he challenged me to show where it was originally stated. I couldn't remember where I got it from, so I googled it. It's easy to find. Several of the popular quote sites have it. But very few sites give the source for any of their quotes. Brett joined in, and soon the discussion was taken up by others on the channel. With their help... I ended up with three likely-looking references to Scientific American, and one apparently definite reference. Frontiers of Modern Biology on Theories of Origin of Life, New York, Horton Miffin, 1972, page 187. I went to Amazon wanting to get a copy. Instead, I got a message that it was out of stock. Then our long-term hero, Brett, kindly sent me a copy of what looked like the most promising reference in Scientific American. A very interesting article by George Wald on the origin of life from the August issue of 1954. It doesn't contain that quote, but it covers all the points it deals with. It gives a good understanding of why Wald might have said it. He points out that there are only two possibilities for the origin of life, supernatural creation and spontaneous generation. He points out that there is no third possibility. So the Enlightenment's materialists chose belief in spontaneous generation as a philosophical necessity. Why? Accepting spontaneous generation is a philosophical necessity to deny God's existence. He goes into detail about Pasteur doing rigorous experiments until biologists accepted that spontaneous generation was disproved. But nevertheless... Wald says he thinks a scientist has no choice but spontaneous generation. Well, yes. With the materialistic, atheistic paradigm which has hijacked the whole of professional science, to remain in good standing, there's no choice but to accept it, even if the evidence shows it is impossible. Since almost all scientists from Kepler and Newton to Kelvin and Faraday, believed in special creation by God, this highlights the huge change in science since the establishment took control. Wald justifies why he's prepared to believe what science has shown to be impossible. The solution he gives is that although today spontaneous generation is impossible, Once upon a time, things must have been very different. A year before this article was published, Stanley Miller 
had given a world-shaking account of an experiment. He'd made a mixture of methane, ammonia and hydrogen. Some water vapour, but no free water and no oxygen. Miller applied electric sparks and produced some organic compounds, including amino acids. Wald accepted the claim that this mixture of gases used by Miller could represent the conditions on the early Earth supposedly billions of years ago. But even so, Wald makes some frank admissions about the impossibility of this story leading to life. The most complex machine man has devised, say an electronic brain, is child's play compared with the simplest of living organisms. The especially trying thing is that complexity here involves such small dimensions. It is on the molecular level. It consists of a detailed fitting of molecule to molecule, such as no chemist can attempt. One only has to contemplate the magnitude of this task to conclude that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. He also shows the enormous difficulty of making the polysaccharides, polynucleotides and polypeptides which are essential to all life forms. But he goes on to say, Yet here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. The assumptions about the early atmosphere were soon shown to be wrong. But the prospect of an explanation for spontaneous generation was just too attractive to acknowledge inconvenient details like that. So within a very short time, we had the certainty of lightning strikes and volcanic eruptions leading to a prebiotic soup full of amino acids and everything else needed for life. So life must have emerged out of that soup. In spite of the fact that the molecules of life disintegrate spontaneously in water. Wald went on to say, This is by far the most significant conclusion, that life as an orderly natural event on such a planet as ours was inevitable. The same can be said of the whole of organic evolution. All of it lies within the order of nature, and apart from details, all of it was inevitable. This utterly unproved idea has dominated biology ever since. Wald has to deny the existence of God, and to do that, he has to rely on miracles. He tells us, Time is in fact the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal is of the order of two billion years. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible. The possible becomes probable. And the probable virtually certain. One only has to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. This is the sort of thing that biologists, who usually know very little about probability, often come up with. And Wald tells us why he's so confident. Astronomers assure us that throughout observable space we can count on the existence of at least 10 million million planets like our own. That's one with 13 zeros after it, or 10 to the power 13 planets. Richard Dawkins rehashed this story in episodes 17 and 18. There are a billion billion galaxies and a plausible number of planets. Think of the implications of that. The fact that there are so many planets in the universe, so many, more, more generally, so many opportunities for life to have originated, entitles us, if we need it, to postulate a theory of the origin of life 
which is just vanishingly, ludicrously improbable. But how well does that shape up to the probability of producing just the essential enzymes that origin of life experts tell us the simplest possible life form would have to have? The brilliant mathematician and scientist Fred Hoyle calculated that probability as one chance in 10 to the power 40,000, which is one chance in one with 40,000 zeros after it, one followed by 13 pages of zeros. The Big Bangers tell us the Big Bang happened 13.7 billion years ago, or 13.7 times 10 to the power 9 years ago. That's 13.7 times 10 to the 9 years, times 365 days, times 24 hours, times 60 minutes, times 60 seconds, which means we have 4.32 times 10 to the 17 seconds since the Big Bang. So if evolution can make a million steps every second on every one of those planets for the whole of the time since the Big Bang, how many steps would it have made altogether? 4.32 times 10 to the 17 seconds by 10 to the 13 planets by 10 to the 6 millionths of a second, which means 4.32 times 10 to the 36 evolutionary steps. So how long will it take to make enough steps to give an even chance of producing just those essential enzymes? 10 to the power 40,000 divided by 4.32 times 10 to the power 36, multiplied by the time since the Big Bang, which equals 2.3 times 10 to the power 39,963 times the age of the Big Bang universe, which is 23 with 13 pages of zeros, but half a line of zeros taken off times the time since the Big Bang. So Wald is going to have to wait an awfully long time. Billions of trillions of quadrillions of times the time since the Big Bang, before his impossibility turns into the faintest hint of a possibility, never mind a certainty. And yet, Wald admits... Spontaneous dissolution is much more probable and hence proceeds much more rapidly than spontaneous synthesis. So he admits what Arthur Wilder Smith, who we met in episodes 52 and 53, said, and what James Tour is saying today. Time does not help spontaneous generation. It hurts it. It means that an entire organism must appear within a very short space of time. Otherwise, breakdown proceeds before the metabolism of the cell can provide the means to hold things together. But anyway, this fascinating article that Brett sent may tell us why Wald might have said what he is so often quoted as saying. And again, thanks a million, Brett. I really appreciate your input. But it doesn't tell us where that quote did actually come from. And Brett made an important point about it. Should we be concerned with what a biologist said 70 years ago? Shouldn't we rather be concerned with what scientists are saying today? The problem is, they're still saying today what Wald said 70 years ago. We just saw that with Richard Dawkins. And they're still giving the same reasons for saying the same thing. And all the impossibilities Wald pointed to are still impossibilities today. Dean Kenyon and Gary Steinman wrote the famous book Biochemical Predestination. 
the certainty of the natural emergence of life, as claimed by Wald, is still a solid bulwark of evolutionary textbooks. But experiments failed to confirm any of the hopeful origin of life hypotheses. Even Dean Kenyon admitted his famous book deals with a failed theory, as he points out in the Access Research Network video on the origin of life. And one of the world's top chemists, James Tour, has shown that impossibilities Wald pointed out are still impossibilities. The impossibility of plausibly making even just carbohydrates, polynucleotides and polypeptides, which are the basic building blocks of all life forms, even the simplest. So I think we have answered Brett's question about what Wald said and what scientists say now, but we haven't located the source of that quote. We can see why that Scientific American article could have been erroneously put forward as the source for that quote. But as we saw earlier, the most probable source seems to be in Frontiers of Modern Biology, 1972. It's out of stock at Amazon, but if anyone can get hold of a copy, I'd be very grateful if you would let me know in the comments what it actually says there. But in the meantime, I'll continue trying to find out the truth about that quote, and I'd appreciate help from anyone interested. And I take comfort in the assurance. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.